Just wanting to point out one thing. I've got a couple people questioning me, and then I'll take other questions. The seven spirits mentioned back in chapter 1, verse 4, was it? Um, is only one Holy Spirit. Some, a couple people got the impression that I was saying that the Holy Spirit split up into seven, and, and that's not what it's trying to say. The, the idea of seven is completion, perfection, but also perfect at seeing everything and knowing everything. And so he just puts that with the seven, um, uh, make sure I read it correctly here, the seven spirits. It's all it says there. I looked at some other places with you, and, and I got confused with some of that. But it's one Holy Spirit. Okay, just to clarify that, and Jim had a question that I need to make sure I repeat. Okay, they've ordered microphones that are going to go out uh, amongst you so that hopefully we can pick it up without me having to repeat, and that'll speed up the study and clarify your, your information because I don't always repeat it exactly right. I'm a rotten gossip, you know. But it's, I can make it really juicy and exciting just to add a little here, a little there. You also make bad questions worse. Oh, oh, yeah, I can improve things too. Okay. Let's jump in. Everybody have study number two. Check. And you, where you sat, you received a study number three mm -hmm. um, for next week, Lord willing, into the first church of Ephesus. Um, let's jump into the middle of this. And I got to get in the habit of reading because I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead and skipping over things. And um, I got my notes mixed up here. Or worse yet, I left some of them. No, I think I got it all. Okay, we're in John or uh, Revelation chapter one, written by John, and uh, starting at verse nine. And so we'll take this first section nine to eleven. He says, "I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation, and kingdom, and perseverance which are in Christ Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice." A loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So the first part here, we've been given an introduction. We looked at last week, and now we're kind of we're jumping into this um, actual vision as it's starting to be recorded to John. Anybody online like a cupcake? <laughs> There are advantages to being here in person. You can, you can have a vision of a cupcake. I could hold one up for you. Oh, yeah. It might, might be a little stale by the time they get around to it. In the what of Lapine? In the island of Lapine, yeah. So I encourage you to come visit. We'll, we'll have other things, um, especially if the numbers start dropping off. I'll have to come up with bribes, whatever it takes. Okay, first question on study number two. Who was seeing the vision? John. Okay, it's just John. And how did he relate to the believers in the seven churches? As a brother and partaker. All right, their brother and fellow partaker. All right, and again, I'm not going into the details of definitions on some of this, but brother here is just telling you he's there. He, like them, are all part of God's family. He's recognizing them as believers, spiritually part of that family. And then as a fellow partaker, he's a co sharer or a participant. In the, um, I need to start bringing more stuff with me. Yep, I think I left some of my notes at my desk at home. That's what I get for not having a place here to have it spread out. But I'll, I'll try to, if I miss something, just point it out to me. Uh, but he's bringing out this co share, and it looks like in what's coming. He's there, uh, he's a brother and a co share in three things. And what are they here? What three things do they have in common? Tribulation, kingdom, kingdom perseverance. and perseverance. And with this um, translation I put out, I give you a little bit of information. Some of that could be transferred over onto your study guide. Um, but I encourage you to look up some of this on your own first and then, and then put that on there. But what is tribulation, basically? Affliction. It's, it's affliction. And what kind of affliction? It's, it's a pressure or compression type of affliction. It's like being in a pressure cooker. It, it's pushing in on you. You ever feel that way? The wine press, the wine press is another way because you're a grape, right? And so this is really compressing. 
Um, it can carry the idea of distress, and so I wrote next to it, um, he, the, uh, John with them, our, fellow, uh, our brother and fellow partaker in their trials, the same affliction or trials relating especially to physical suffering here. All right, when you get to the second one, he said that he is a brother and fellow partaker in the kingdom. What did that represent? A little quieter. Linda? Okay, kingdom of God in general. Christ hasn't returned yet, so it's not a reality on earth where Jesus Christ is reigning over the earth. So what is he referring to when he talks about the kingdom of God? Leo? Leo? Okay, we, they have the same king. That would be a good way of putting it. They're, they're co-sharers and they're uh, fellow believers brothers in that relationship, Jim? They're, they're members of that realm. Okay, members of the, of the realm, the spiritual realm that Christ has already secured um, as the king over those peoples. Um, and so I put down here the same king, the first one physical suffering in the tribulation, the second one is spiritual suffering. What's happening to Christ's kingdom on earth at this time prior to him coming back and actually reigning in person? Look at Acts 14.22 just to grab a verse that would kind of explain that a little bit that I'm going to guess here because I forgot who the author, I think it's Paul talking. Acts 14.22. Um, same, uh, I mean physical suffering and then in this case spiritual suffering. Acts 14.22 says, uh, and again context, let me go to 21. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So he's kind of bringing that out in a flavor of you're, you're moving into this kingdom, you're, you're giving more and more uh, control and authority to Jesus Christ, you're submitting to him, you were justified and placed into the kingdom, you're now being sanctified where you're becoming a better and better citizen within that kingdom. And one day be glorified with a new body that can enter into the actual kingdom with Christ in person. So just a, a verse that kind of caught my eye when I was looking at some of that. So they had in common tribulation. They had the kingdom in common that we're all part of as believers. And then thirdly, they had perseverance in common. What does that one represent? Cheerful endurance. Okay, could be cheerful. It's hupomeno, to abide under is literally what the word means. And so hopefully it's cheerful. I don't always do it that way. Um, but they're showing this patient waiting. It's the same endurance um, that John and the, the um, seven churches are all going through the same endurance. And so it goes from physical suffering with number one. And I'll repeat any of this. Just ask me. Number two is a spiritual suffering. Number three is more of a long-term suffering. This is going to go on. The idea of endurance is really to abide up under something for a period of time. You're kind of um, settling in for a long haul, a long winter, a long marriage. You, you don't put your marriage in that. A long struggle would be better than a long marriage. But, but you're trying to bring up, it, this hupomeno brings up the idea that this is something you're abiding under. So it's, it's stretching it out. It isn't just today's tribulation and today's kingdom that your fellow partakers with. It's also the ongoing patient endurance that they have, all three of these, in Christ Jesus. So does that kind of make sense? Did I, did I go too fast? And this is all John trying to bring out to them. He identifies with them. Who was John? He was one of the disciples. How, how would you picture him? How, how would you describe him if you had to uh, do a, um, what do they call them when, when you're getting a job opportunity, you get kind of a character, a resume, a resume or reference thing about him? Pat? I think he has strong character. Okay, John has strong character because he's a, he's a leader here, definitely. When he was with Jesus, he never went too far. He wasn't walking on water. He wasn't sticking his foot in his mouth. He wasn't impulsive like some of them. He wasn't greedy like some. He was also a disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, disciple whom Jesus loved. So he had a very unique relationship with him. And so you can see him at this age of, say, 90. We'll just pick that age um, that he's identifying. He's gone through it for decades under Roman law, Roman rule. And where is he at right now? He's going to tell you on the island of Patmos. We'll talk about that. So that was the next question. Where was John physically? 
on the island of Patmos. That's between Greece and Turkey. I gave you a map with one of these handouts. Now I'm starting to mix them all up. Okay, so in tonight, so the last page of study number three, you'll see a map. Study number three. It's, it has, it's in color, okay? So you see Patmos off the coast. You see that? Okay, everybody found that. And it's just southwest uh, of Ephesus. I like this map, and I know I had some offers, and, and, but this one, it puts Ephesus as a port city, even though the, river, the rivers kept silting up. And they had a, today, if you go to Ephesus, it's six miles from the ocean because of that. But it was a port city. Smyrna was a port city, and you can see how they kind of go to those narrow strips that go into them, whereas Pergamum is 15 miles in, and then it drops back down. So when he's writing these, and he's mentioning these names down a little further in verse 11, he starts with Ephesus and goes north to Smyrna, then to Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. This was a kind of a mail route that they would have taken things on, and they're taking this dispatch. This scroll that has been recorded by John, they take it on the same course. They start it in Ephesus because John wrote it in the island, on the island of Patmos. And somehow, I don't know who was there, who visited him, uh, how they let things go. The Romans must not have cared that you're sending out this propaganda. But everyone wants to say, well, it was in code because that's what apocalyptic literature is. And I'm sorry I keep pointing that out. I'm going, uh, this is... You don't want to go down that road. You, you don't want to start making this into what they call a mystery when apocalyptic means revelation, unveiling, disclosing. It's not a mystery. A mystery, according to your study tonight, is a secret. This book is not a secret. So watch out when they try to put things in boxes and describe them certain ways. But it's, he wrote it in Patmos down here off the coast, and it got, was taken up to Ephesus, and they traveled around with the one letter. Now, I don't know when they started recording and, and making more of them, but this is how it initially starts off. And that's the island he's on. Jim, before we move on. Well, I was just going to say the, the possibility for that is um, one thing I read about Patmos is it was a builder of Babylon, and it was a, um, a island for criminals, kind of like Australia. So, so Jim's, Jim's describing this island, and I'm supposed to be repeating. It's an island for criminals, because right. I asked you on that next line, describe this island. And they provided nothing for you, so... And so you had to have nothing provided for you. They had to, others had to bring it in to take care of you. And that's how he could have got the letter out. And so, but again, uh, not only got it out with one of those people, but was permitted to have it go out. Right. Maybe somebody didn't want to read all those pages on, written out on a scroll. Okay, other things that others w um, viewed here but about the island of Patmos. What did you find? How big is it? Ten miles long. Ten miles long? Six miles wide. Six miles wide. How big is, the, is Lake Tahoe? Roughly 14 by 7. Roughly 14 by 7. How big is the Sea of Galilee? Roughly the same, 14 by 7. And again, I'm off a little bit on that, but it gives, it gives you a ballpark. So this island would have fit inside of Lake Tahoe which you can easily see across, even though it's, it's big, and it's really, really deep. Um, Ten miles long, six miles wide. What sea is it in? I didn't put it on your maps. I try to keep this. The Aegean Sea, all right. It's crescent-shaped and treeless and rocky. Crescent-shaped, treeless, and rocky. And so the Romans used it for a penal colony. So if you're there, more than likely you're, you're being represented uh, or you're being called a criminal. A convict. And about 40 miles from the coastline, what is Asia Minor on the top of your map, that is modern-day Turkey that starts there and goes way east. And, um, and so, that, but this area was Asia Minor and then Asia Major, the bigger part of Asia, spread out a whole lot bigger. But this was just an area they called that. And um, anything else about the island that you wrote down that you wanted to share? Why is it rocky and bare? What, what kind of rock? It's volcanic, all right? So, and what? Um, did they have marble there? Okay. Okay, they, and they put them to work, and that may have been part of it. There may have been some deposits of marble. 
Um, you can get very lengthy. This is two pages on just the island of Patmos, but it goes along with a, a movie series that I don't have. It'd be nice to share. Even when I got this in the first place, I never saw the movies. And I, I felt like I was robbed about 40 years ago. But, and so I don't know where to go get them, and they're probably so ancient you'd be distracted by the um, haircuts and clothing they're wearing and all that kind of stuff. Unless they're, they're really viewing the Island of Patmos. But anyway, we got off subject here. So um, he's, he's a worker there. He has to uh, earn his keep. He, they don't want him out amongst the Roman citizens. He's gotten in trouble, and he's gotten sent off there. And how old is he? 90. About 90, 85, 95. They always decimate. Um, and so uh, how much rock uh, marble removing is he doing? He's probably not worth a whole lot, and he has time to write. Somebody's providing him the scroll material, the writing material, and so you get the impression they weren't working them to death. It wasn't one of those kind of penal colonies, or he wouldn't have made it and wouldn't have been able to write. So why was he there according to verse 9? Because of the word of the Lord and the testimony of Jesus. And so I'll go back to my, my uh, translation here, the jet translation. He was on the island of Patmos for the sake of the message of God. So something had been shared out regarding the word or the message of God, and then also for what he is passing on regarding the specific testimony of Jesus. They didn't want to hear that. And that's why he's been sent off to this penal colony uh, and probably being persecuted because of it. But not a lot of shared, and you don't see John um, complaining. You don't see him telling you. Paul was a lot more specific, but he, he even apologized for having to bring that up at the end of 2 Corinthians that he had to explain what had happened to him, that he'd been beaten and this and that because they were questioning if he was an apostle, if he really was sold out. And so he kind of apologizes as he goes in and says, let me give you my credentials. John doesn't need to do that. And so you, you see nothing even though he may have been beaten and have a lot of issues. But as you um, come there, um, what state was he in according to verse 10? Spirit. He was in spirit. And the translation I gave you leaves out the definite article it's not in the greek it literally just says he's in spirit because the tendency when you say he's in the spirit which spirit are we talking about it tends to be the holy spirit but he's just in spirit which leaves out the holy spirit here it should not be capitalized if you take that position and some don't so you, your version may have it capitalized but what does that exactly mean i put equal signs just to tell me what is what does it mean to be in spirit here if you haven't gotten used to my my methods if I don't have room to write, uh, define this, and then I leave you this little bitty line, I, I make it bigger. Paul? Okay, in a sense, communion with the Lord, but in what form? Okay, mentally? What's it like when you're in spirit? Okay, that's what you're doing, but what's the state, Jim? And I didn't repeat that. You're, you're communing, but um, Jim? Well, I, I just heard it twice in the Bible. Uh, spirit means wind or breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something an airhead. <laughs> okay. Spirit means wind and breath, and Jim's called him an airhead because of that, but uh, okay. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't get. Okay, let me put it real simple, just, just to clear. Oh, okay, I have more answers. I didn't see hands up. Linda, answer. Okay, some will say a state of inspiration or ecstasy. Some even want to call it a trance. Whenever I find that in my commentaries, I run a line through that. He's not in a trance. That's not what this means. What he's trying to tell you is this wasn't an actual physical happening. It was a spiritual happening. That, that's all. A lot of this is simpler than a lot of people want to make it out to be. He's, because if it was a physical happening, what would be impossible? No man can see God and live he's not seeing him in a physical realm he's seeing him in a spiritual realm i put on the translation for you and then bev's going to pass on i said spiritual realm or a mental vision is what he's receiving here oh okay yeah the, the idea of vision is you want to stress it because that's what this is it's not a physical occurrence 
but he's seen it as if it is. If, if you've had some dreams that are really, really vivid, and you wake up and you go, what was that? And you can describe it sometimes, especially if it scared you, scared the living daylights out of you, or whatever. But, but Paul, uh, John here is getting something that is so realistic that he can write it down in detail. He's staying in that state for, it isn't just a, you weren't just dreaming for a few minutes. And this isn't a dream. He doesn't call it a dream. He could have used that word as well. He's in a state where, and it could happen very quickly, because God can do that supernaturally. How does John remember all of this? Is, is he saying, hey, 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 kind of like I'm doing here. Okay, I got to repeat what you're saying because other people can't hear. Or John goes to, to Jesus, wait, wait, I got to write this down or I'm going to forget before you give me something else. This is supernaturally inspired to one of his apostles who had a, that role to play. So you, it's kind of weird, and that's why Jim was honest, and most of us have to be the same honest. We don't fully understand this, but it, but it doesn't fit some of the ways that you see things happening in Scripture, whether it's a trance or it's a dream, or, or it, I don't know what ecstasy means myself, but, but it's just trying to bring out that th this wasn't a physical occurrence but it was as close to it as possible, and I could write everything down in exact detail. And that's what he's doing here. And what, what was the day? The Lord's Day. What day was that? Saturday is the Sabbath. Good guess. The more you, you stick your neck out, the more you learn. I can give you 10 examples off the top of my head from the last 40 years of when I spoke up. I did one at a camp. This is my worst one. I said something in front of a bunch of people that was flat out wrong, and I knew it was wrong, but I didn't think too fast and said it wrong. So don't ever be afraid to speak up. That, see, like that, I will never misunderstand that word again, and I will never say it out loud wrong. It sticks. So the more you can interact with this, the better. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. Just be afraid of not studying God's word and figuring it out. So the Sabbath is the, which day? It's the seventh day because that's where God rested or he ceased working on the Sabbath. He declared it to be the Sabbath, the day for Israel to cease working and put out their own efforts and their own creating, if you want to put it that way. So this is the first day of the week because it is the Lord's Day, which was Sunday. Yep, it's the resurrection day. It's the first day of the week when he resurrected. Yeah, and so Sunday would be a weekly, what was the second word? Weekly fest of, oh, the, fest, Lord's okay. of the Lord's resurrection. So this is, that's the simple answer. I'm trying to keep this simple. I can give you six other explanations for what this means. Then none of them fit in scripture. None of them fit with the context here. Pat? Okay, because it's New Testament, does this indicate that the Lord's Day is Sunday? And yes. And, and you can look around for that. But what people try to do with this, and I'll give you a couple of those six examples, they want this to be the day of the Lord. They, they want to take it from Lord's Day to day of the Lord, and that makes no sense when you understand Old Testament, New Testament, what the day of the Lord is. That's not what, what John's going through here. There may be some indications, 8, 8 to 11, will bring up some things that talk about the day of the Lord, but it's not the focus of the book. And so but they'll do things like that. Look for the simple. Remember what I keep trying to stress to you? Go for the cultural, contextual, historical, grammatical, literal translation. Look for the literal. And then have something in there that tells you it's figurative. Like it's an impossible to, to happen. It, it, is there no way that that was real? And you'll see some of those in Scripture where, and I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, when he calls them a metaphor as a door or as a bread or as other things, you're recognizing that that's a, that's a metaphor, that's a figure that he's using. And if I were to take away all of your figures of speech, and I've said this to a number of you many a time, you couldn't talk. <laughs> See, right there, is that true that you couldn't talk if I took away your metaphors? See, right there, you've got to figure out, are you talking literally or figuratively? Are you saying I would really be limiting what could come out or, or my mouth would be taped shut? See, we cannot communicate in English without using figures of speech. So you're reading some of them, 
But when we read them in the scriptures, we want to change them or make them go away or blow them up into purport, some proportion that takes it way out of reason. So you got to figure out how were they using it. And that often if they use the word like or as or resembling, then you know it's not the exact thing. He's just doing the best he can to tell you. But um, figures of speech are okay. There's nothing wrong with them. Just don't go making them walk on all fours, which is what they want to do with the book of Revelation. They want to make it into a mystery, and everything is symbolic. And if you do that, it, nothing means anything. Now, so I keep stressing that to you, which is why the book, you go back for the simple. The simple here, he's in spirit versus being physically watching this, and he's on the Lord's day. He said, this is the first day of the week. How do you know that? How do you know what day of the week it was? Obviously, somebody kept track. And he was a Jew. What did he do on the Sabbath? Potentially, unless he was being beaten to death. So he's keeping track of what's going on around his life. But he's also a believer who understands what the first day of the week represents. The day in which our Lord resurrected. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside. They use the term in Scripture, but here John simply goes for Lord's Day. And I didn't mean to take too long with that, but I know it's confusing, and um, it's not what I was taught. So I am also having to undo um, some of that. So catch me if I say it wrong. What did John hear in verse 10? Loud voice, or how can that word also be used? It's voice in your translations typically, but it can also mean a loud sound. The, word, the Greek word is just phone. Where, where do we use that? Phonograph, and then when they came along, telephone, because it just means sound that's being transferred. And so it just means, it means sound, but it can be the sound of a voice. So you have to determine by the context what's the sound. And in this case, because the sound speaks to him, you kind of get the idea that this has to be a voice, so they translate it that way. But I just want you to recognize that he's hearing this loud voice, and what is it like? Did I write? Did I? Um, just to add to that. Like the sound of a trumpet. It doesn't say loud trumpet. It says loud voice. It's a loud sound, so it must be a loud trumpet. But what is... What is like the sound of a trumpet? What is like a trumpet, literally, which is what I put on your translation? Bold okay, bold, clear. I took that off the translation. Anything? Yeah, get your attention. When they use the trumpets in, in the orchestra or the band, it's definitely um, probably one of the loudest instruments in there. Brass. It's a brassy sound. Okay, so it's really crisp and clean. It was a common sound in Roman ceremonies. So whether he's referring to the Roman trumpet or to the Jewish trumpet, it, he's not explaining here. Some people want to translate this like a war trumpet. And how loud was a war trumpet? Very loud. So he's just, the emphasis he's trying to make here is that you couldn't miss it. But where is it happening? Behind him. Why not in front of him? Why didn't this trumpet just show up, and, or it wasn't a trumpet, why didn't this voice show up or this image show up, which is what we're going to get down into? Why is he doing it behind him? How's he maybe showing him a little bit of mercy? He's not, startled. not as startled, kind of like one thing at a time. So you're, he starts talking in this voice that's like a trumpet, and then John has to turn around and get a little more and a little more and a little more, and this is what the vision is, is just sharing with him as he goes along. And what two commands did John receive from this loud voice, because he hadn't turned around yet. Okay, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. If you're not using some of your tools online, which is at your level, whatever you're able to understand, you may not know that these are commands. So I try to spell them out to you, and um, I had you uh, define just the second one. So the word write, just the first one here, I put it on uh, verse 11, write. Oh, write it once. I knew I did something with it. So write it once because it's a command. It's trying to give you a, a stern um, requirement of what you do at this moment. Write. Okay? So you want to make sure you understand it. And you write it in a book or a scroll. Is the um, Biblion is how the word would have been understood in that day. 
And then he says, and write what you see. Why didn't he say write, write what you see and hear? Because that's what he does. So is he just leaving out part of it? Is he, is he kind of stressed? Just write the vision you're receiving and what all of it contains. I don't know, but I just keep, I want to notice things when I go along. I just look for what's there and what isn't there. Jim? That, that uh, word blepo, I can't think of the word. Blepo? Okay, and so deceiving, discerning with that idea, uh, what are you able to write down? Are you able to write down something you don't perceive or you don't discern? If it's, if I want to, and I said, now write that down. <laughs> you couldn't do it. So it's, it's obviously discernible. It, it's bringing out that flavor. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I'm not leaving out the hearing. I'm just noticing that. He's, he's got limited space on his scroll, and he leaves off the, the hearing part. But what is more common in the book? I saw, I saw, I saw. If you grab your concordance and look it up, you'll see how many of those there are in the book of Revelation. Then you look up the word I heard. If you put it in that, and, and there may be some de de uh, deviations from that, but you'll find out I saw is the bulk of it, which is why I stress that this is more of a vision. But obviously there were things heard that explained the vision. So, two commands. Second one was send. Uh, and I get back to where send it to the seven churches, and you had to look that up. Thirty nine ninety two. And what did that mean? Dispatch, transmit. Okay, dispatch, transmit. And what? Put it forth to an intended audience is how one lexicon described it. So he's got a mission here. He isn't just recording it. It isn't a personal diary that he's going to hide from everybody until he's dead or journal, or whatever you want to call it. Is diary female only? No. But whatever you're going to do with that, and then you're, um, you're, but he's telling them, I don't want you just to put it down, I want you to get it out. And so make sure with a command um, to send it to the seven churches. And then he describes the seven churches. Ephesus, number one, Smyrna, I think you probably got all these down, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. What did you find? I put in here, I gave you options to fill in and describe slash define if you can. So what did you put in that little bitty line, just a synopsis about Ephesus? And I give you the numbers because a couple of those, they'll give you a definition. Ephesus did not have a definition anywhere I could find. All of these names mean something, but it's not, in, not recorded in history. Linda? Okay, as a definition? Okay. Desirable was one option of a definition. Pat? Permitted. Permitted. Okay, so those are opposites from each other. And Jan found? Oh, I just said city in Asia Minor. But okay. And that would fit on there. City in Asia Minor, which uh, true about all of them. Okay, and you've got to figure out where the provinces are, which I didn't put on here. I could, could, could have given you a map with the mountains and the terrain and the provinces and other cities. And the more I looked through the maps, I went, I'm just going to, I want you to just see the basic idea of what's going on here. Okay, so I chose that. That's my decision. It was a seaport. They, only two of them are seaports. It was wealthy. It, it, okay, Artemis, also known as. Diana, it, Diana is, now I'm going to mix them up, one's Roman and one's Greek. Greek. I think Diana was the one they're worshiping at the time, so there's probably a focus on the Roman. Um, Artemis would have been the, the Greek one, is that what you're saying? Okay, Greek, Artemis, in, the, in your Bible um, dictionary, um, Roman, Diana, the Romans took over. They blended the gods. That's common with what many countries do when they take over another country. They take advantage. They took, uh, the Romans took uh, the days of the week and transformed them into making them be what they wanted them to say. Dave? Okay, maritime port? Under Roman rule. Okay, 
it's a metropolitan mix of all kinds of peoples, groups coming through. Um, but again, if I were to focus on what they worshipped there, they worshipped what kind of idol? They basically worship sex. How are we doing in America? <laughs> Used to be you could go to cities in Nevada. I had a teacher in junior, high, in junior college in a history class that loved to talk about sex, and we hardly ever got on the topic. And he handed out a map to all the brothels in Nevada to a bunch of college students, 18, 19, 20 years old. The guy was deranged. I gave him a cassette tape at the end of that class as an extra thing with a letter to him uh, from Josh McDowell called Maximum Sex. He was so into it, I thought, maybe he'll listen to this, and then he'll understand how God created it and what it's for, and then share the gospel with him. But, uh, but anyway, th this is common in our day-to-day, -day, and it isn't just Nevada now. You can probably find maps to all kinds of places everywhere you go. But how about Smyrna? What's the definition of Smyrna? Myrrh is where you can see it in the name, um, but myrrh is the definition. That was an ointment or a, how would you describe myrrh? Kind of a perfumey, smelly ointment, okay, that they would have used. And again, it's one of the ones used in preparation, given as a gift at Jesus' birth and used at his death. I don't know if it's the same gift, but I'm just saying. So what was Smyrna? What stood out about Smyrna? You look on the map, where was it again? Seaport. Also like Ephesus, it was very rich, very wealthy. Like Portland, it would have, yep, it would have brought them in. They're way inland, but they still are a major distribution center. Was, uh, was there a nickname of the lovely? A nickname of the lovely? Yeah. Okay. It was a very influential city, which some of them were, some of them were not. Some of them were kind of out in the boonies uh, just to be traveling through or to be protecting the Roman Empire. Uh, what did they worship at Smyrna? Pagans. <laughs> I, okay, pagans, but, but especially one pagan. The emperor was a major um, source of persecution. That's why when you go and you look into Smyrna, which we will, they are one of the only one of two churches that he says there. Um, I know your tribulation, your poverty, your, that you're rich. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. Um, the persecuted church is what I'm looking for here. Uh, yeah, he warns them in verse 10 what's going to happen to them. They're very persecuted because it was emperor worship. What did you have to declare? That he was God, and if you didn't, up with his head or something just as painful. So they, they worship the emperor, and it costs them a lot. And you, when you get into the second letter, you realize the persecution they were undergoing for those who refused to worship him as God. How about Pergamum? Has a definition even. Wow, wow. Anybody find it? Okay, it's what elevation? Oh, heights or elevation. So the definition I found was citadel. Citadel. Because of the position, it was 15 miles inland. It was what to the pro province? Headquarters. These are all key cities that he's bringing this up to. Why would Paul, Paul wouldn't go out to some little village with 15 people in it that probably couldn't even have a church to begin with. That would be part of the problem. He went to metropolitan areas where a lot of people passed through because he wanted the gospel to go out, where there were churches established because there were Jews there who many have come to Christ or scattered and gone to that location. 15 miles inland, pro pro uh, provincial headquarters, capital of Asia Minor. So now we're talking about the whole region there that it carried a lot of weight, and especially more to the north, Pergamum. What did they develop that, had, that it was big deal and went on for a long time? Parchment. And what did, well, they manufactured part of it, and what did they call it? They, had, they called it vellum. They had a library with vellum books written on animal skins because that's what it was. They got away from the uh, Egyptian scrolls of papyrus. They went to vellum here, and they, they had a library of 250,000 volumes royal library but i'm just saying it was a big deal and that was the start that went on for a long long time that they were using parchment until they could develop some type of paper or some other methods to do that with and you said a second thing that was there okay the royal library and the manufacturing of parchment 
stood out there. I'm taking a little too long with these, but uh, Thyatira, what do we notice about it? How does it go the other direction? Okay, it's... Um, I'm sorry, I, you, you Macedonia, it, Greece on the other side of the G and C, so... Okay, had a lot of Greek influence to it, okay. It was a much smaller city than these that we've labeled so far. Why was it important for Paul to write to them? Pat, did you share something? Okay, false teaching was kind of rampant through all of them. They, they had their flavors, um, but it was to a manufacturing center. And what, what thrived there? Okay, they're guilds that use the special water. In the one case with Lydia and the purple dye, that was her area. They had many guilds, which we would call unions today. If you did not join the guild, you did not work. To join the guild, you had to commit yourself to their paganism in general. We'll go to these when we go in each of the cities. And so the Christians were being squeezed out. What do you see happening in America today? If you don't get vaccinated... You can't get into certain places or maybe lose your job. So we're already seeing some twinges of what dominated the, the city of Thyatira. But the guilds and a wide variety of manufacturing were rampant there. You can go back into the book of Acts. We'll pull out some of this when we get to each of the individual churches. And you can see Lydia, um, who worked with purple dye and um, dyed clothes that way. She, but she became a believer. And so um, we moved down. Oh, yes? The cities were close together? Okay, I got a lot of dead time. So what you're saying is they seem close together, but stop and look back at it a second. Patmos to Ephesus. I mean, Patmos just to the shore is how far? 40 miles. You don't have cars. You don't have motorcycles. You're traveling sometimes where it would take you a long time. And if you start spacing, so they're really further apart. And then you have landscape. They, they weren't just direct shots, some of these. And we'll, as we go into them, you'll realize some of them were hidden valleys. One of them is um, um, Sardis, which we'll get you next, is 1,500 feet above the valley. And they use that for protection. So I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but it's, there, there was a lot of distance. And there were reasons why they were similar as Roman cities, but distinct because either how they had performed for the Romans and earned different statuses or because of what they offered the travelers and the tradespeople that came through there. Um, some of this opened up all the way into the Orient. Remember Marco Polo and um, some others, again, not to go into detail, but there were, they put out great effort to get over to the Orient and get the teas and the, what else did they offer? Silks, uh, the variety of things they want to come back. If you did it by ship, it was months and months and hazardous. So these people, there was a trade route that would enter and go into that oriental area, and they were some of the ones used for that. But Sardis, being 1,500 feet above the valley, was also very wealthy. What did they worship? And I'm not assuming you went into all of this. I just want to find out. Especially the sun and the moon was kind of a focus. And, and the sun, was because it was the god that the Caesar worshipped, also the same sun god, and so they joined in with him. So they're kind of still worshipping Caesar in some of that, I'm going to get skippier here because I'm taking too much time. Number six, Philadelphia, what is the definition? Did you do Sardis? Uh, I just did Sardis. Okay. 1,500 feet above the valley, wealthy, worship the sun and the moon. No definition that I found. Anybody find a definition? Sardis. Okay, how about Philadelphia? It means brotherly love, literally. So when you have a city called Philadelphia, you have the city of brotherly love. City is not in the name, in the meaning, just means brotherly love. What is it recognized for just in that short little space? Okay, lots of earthquakes on the one hand, very rich farmland on the other, probably the richest of the areas here. And then when you go into it, they call it a gateway city. You see where it's located. And I think some of that, you'd have to have the topography brought out for you to see where it actually let them go through some mountain ranges and get head out east, which a lot of them did. 
But the earthquakes caused the, the believers to do what? Besides run. If you did any work on it, you realize because of the earthquakes, everybody was scared spitless. They, they would get away from the city. They would go out into these farmlands, and they would be afraid to go up under anything that was going to collapse on them, which it often did. And so the Christians were able to stand out because they what? They trusted God, but how'd they show that? But they didn't panic, and when the earthquakes happened and people lost everything, it was the Christians that came back in and ministered to them. So it's interesting that you find out here some, inter, uh, some facts about these cities that God gave opportunity to one. So if you live in California, you can be, consider yourself blessed. You have opportunity to go back in and minister to some of these people. And the last one, Laodicea, what's the meaning? I realized, I even looked up in English dictionaries, I looked up in the Bible dictionary, I looked up in the, the Greek meaning of these terms in the lexicons. Often they didn't say much. This one simply means two words put together, rule of the people. Rule for, brings, comes out, people comes out. And so it's where we get our, the idea of democracy as um, what we call rule of the people, which is fascinating when the Romans dominated. So I don't know what, why they were claiming that. They also were very wealthy on that little line next to it. They had three things that stood out in this group, and it was what three? Gold, garments, and I put the word gaze because I have to come up with another G. He tells them to um, turn in those things at Laodicea. They were going after the physical, and he says, get the spiritual. And so we'll study that when we get to it. But very wealthy. They had the, the gold in their banking, the garments in their black wool that they were known for all over. People loved their black wool. And they were, um, the gaze was in their eye salve that they were applying physically, but he, in the letter he tells them to apply it spiritually. So Laodicea is the one church that they do not use any descriptions about Jesus Christ in. As you go study these letters, you realize the next one next week is to the one holding the golden candlesticks. Let me see if I can find it here. 2 verse uh, 1. Um, these things says the one holding the seven stars and in his right hand of him and the one walking, I'm sorry, walking in the midst of the seven lampstands. Th those are descriptions coming out of chapter 1. The first six churches get something about Jesus Christ mentioned in the specific letter to them except for Laodicea. And basically, Laodicea was a dead assembly. The question I had when I taught this, I was stressing, I wonder if there were any believers there at all. They called themselves the church. When you look at what he tells Laodicea to do, um, they're missing everything. So just an interesting layout. But it's because they had everything. That spoils us. That causes us to not need God. And the church had compromised and and maybe stop sharing the gospel. I don't know. Their water also was well known because it was lukewarm. One aqueduct coming from the mountains with cold water by the time it got to them, lukewarm. Another aqueduct coming from the, from the plain area that had boiling waters from a, some type of a, I forget the word used, hot pools or uh, geysers. By the time it got to them, lukewarm. And so as John writes to them, inspired by God, it's Jesus speaking actually, and John just passes it on. It's, um, he uses that, that you're lukewarm, and I want to spit you out of your, my mouth. I don't want to throw you up. I just initially get that, that lukewarm water, and I'm expecting cold or I'm expecting hot, and I want to spit it out because, what's that? Like you do when you have a lukewarm cup of coffee. You thought it was still hot. You take a sip, and you go, come on, be honest. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. It's, ah, okay, I got at least one person responding to me. All right, I need to keep moving or I'm going to be in trouble. Huh? As you, oh, this is going to go fast. And, uh, on the vision part, verses 12 to 20, let's read it because that's the mo more important side of it. And then we're going to answer it really quick. I turn, and I turn to see the voice. Okay, finally, we're, we're, we've, we've got this information and all this speaking given to him while his back's turned. You get that? Then he says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle, and his head and his hair were, like, were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, 
And his feet were like burnished bronze when it is caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things. And as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right, so we go to the question of verse 12, under vision there. How did John react to the sound? Okay, he turned to see the voice that was speaking to him. So the sound didn't scare him to death. Although it was loud, sounding like a trumpet, it, that's not what scared him to death. All right? And that's what you want to pick up in the book, kind of look and ask yourself, here's the sound, here's what he heard, but here's what I saw, 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 and I heard, and I saw, 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 and I saw. You, you kind of got that idea in there? You, you want to pick up the gist of the book. And so here he's trying to tell us, um, he turned to see the voice or the sound. What did John see first? Seven golden, Seven golden lampstands. Those didn't scare him, right? And then he says, oh, I had you define lampstand. 3087, it's not a candlestick. It's not a candlestick. It's not a candlestick. I even have people, for some reason, I don't have up here. The Greek lexicon goes out of its way, the big daddy lexicon, Bauer, Art, and Gingrich, and it writes in there, it's not a candlestick. So that's not normal in definitions. They don't go in there and tell you what they're not. They tell you what they are. Well, he, I guess he got tired of having people call it a candlestick. So what is it? Everything I saw is a candlestick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not a candlestick. Nice. So what? everything he saw was said candlestick. I'm sorry, I'm not repeating. And Beth? It's not the, the lamp used in the lamp. Okay, it's not the lamp. If you looked up the Greek... Sorry, it's what some of them are telling you, but it's not the lamp. It's the lamp stand. stand. It's what you sit the lamp on. What's the lamp look like typically? Not a candle. It was a little oil lamp with the, the light coming out the tip and the, the, the middle part where you could pour more oil in to keep it going. You can let it burn while you're pouring oil in at the same time. Pretty ingenious. Try doing that with a candle. Okay, anyway, but it's, it's fragile. So I stressed to you last time, the lamp stand is where you sit the lamp. It can be a projection. It can be like a um, plant stand. I'm not saying it can't be a raised surface, sometimes, but it's not a candlestick. It can be a raised surface that's portable even, that you can bring in and move around the room because you, you don't want to be stuck to just where the bedroom would always put the light the same place. Your, your light in your bedroom probably hasn't moved in 20 years. It's next to the bed or it's standing over in the corner. It's just how we do things. But when we put them in the ceiling, but they couldn't do that very well with an oil lamp. So if you try to raise it, it won't work? No. Nope. There's some kind of stand for the lamps. And he's, he's in the midst of it. So they're around him, whatever they are. I'm not saying they aren't portable, and I'm not saying they aren't walls. I, it's not described. That isn't what's pointed out here. He just tells you that he said, I turned and saw seven golden lamp stands. And I'm the one being dramatic about that. Other people would say, ah, it's just a candlestick. Well, we don't have any candles. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But any, and then he goes on to describe this. You notice I'm going to start picking up speed, so tell me, slow down, Jack. Uh, who was in the middle of the lampstands? One like a son of man. Yeah, one like a son of man. Define son of man here. You're going to get a major common definition that isn't what this is saying. Look at the text, and what does it say? It's like, what does that mean? Similar to, resembles, what? The son of man? No. A son of man, which generalizes, and it goes back to what Jim just said. Offspring it's an offspring of humans. It's just a human being. It's, it's a man of some sort. That's all he says at first. But it's like that because it obviously isn't normal. Okay, that, that's what you want to pick up. But he's not overreacting yet, right? 
until John has to describe this son of man visibly. What's to the feet? The robe. Clothed in a robe. What's his breast like? Girded with a golden girdle. Okay, some people want it to be a sash coming down this way. That's not what it is. It goes literally across the breast. It's this direction. So you'll have straps coming in with this golden um, girdle wrapping around the chest, the upper chest. Not the belly to hold it in like I need, but the chest. If you, You'll see pictures of this. It was a form of dress they even had back in the day. And so this was special. Um, but he's girded across his breast with a golden girdle. What's number three? His head and his hair. White like wool, white like, wool, like snow. snow. These aren't black sheep. These are white sheep. You could have black sheep, but he's describing the typical look of what the, a Jewish understanding. It was like wool, like snow. That's his head. What does that tell you when you see somebody with hair like that? Older. Older? Yeah, not old. Don't You can't say old. Older. <laughs> Older than me or something like that. <laughs> Premature. What? Intelligence. Oh, very good. Gray hair. Yeah, this, is, this isn't gray. This is white. So we, we're going beyond normal intelligence here. How about his eyes? Like a flame of fire. Like a flame of fire. What is, what is that? My dad looked like that. And, and some of you have seen me like that. But that's not what it is. That's just a joke. What does that really look like? Can you imagine looking at somebody whose eyes were like a flame of fire? Absolutely very bright. You've seen too many mysteries. Too many, I'm not mysteries, too many, um, what do you describe? Sci-fi movies. And they try to create some of this. So they got laser beams coming out of their eyes or whatever. And it's not, it really can't be produced by man. And so you just said. Oh, it would be very bright. Very bright. Okay, good. Because I'm having to repeat because I have to remember. And very piercing would be it, even though it isn't maybe a laser. We don't know. All he says is it's like a flame of fire. And John's basically saying not normal, not normal, not normal, not normal. How about number five about his feet? Like burnished bronze, caused to glow in, the glow in the furnace. So I looked up bronze because that's what New American says. Some of yours says brass. Bronze is copper plus, if Bernie's listening to me, he won't get to this for a couple days, so don't tell him. Um, but they're, good, they're following along. Um, bronze is copper plus what? Or you, you can answer this. I just mean, don't, don't tell him between now and, and before he's going to watch this. Okay, it's 10. Tin, and they have a weight, and tin is its own element, okay? Tin isn't something. It, it is what it is. Just like gold, it is what it is. So it has its own atomic weight, and it tells you all that. Its own number, SN. So when you go to brass, brass is copper plus zinc, and it too, zinc has its own atomic number, its own um, letters, ZN. So you're taking copper, which has its own atomic number, uh, um, weight, and it's Cu, and you're, you're mixing these, and they have reasons for some of that. Brass comes out in a shinier way. Bronze comes out a little more reddish. I don't know if it's because they use more copper. I don't, I don't know what happens with this. But when you come to this, I couldn't get anybody to confirm to me, was it bronze or brass? Because they don't know. What the Romans did or who they did or how they did it back in the day, they don't really know. So you're going to have to imagine what's the shinier way. But here, either one of them, you'd have to put bronze in a furnace and see what it looked like to see what this looked like. Because that's how he's trying to describe it. Like burnished bronze caused to glow in a furnace, right? So that is a unique look in and of itself. How about his voice? Like the sound of many waters. That's when your mother called you home for supper, and the whole neighborhood could hear it. Sound of many waters is just loud, almost deafening. You ever been to my Niagara Falls? Did you take the little boat ride down front? And what could you hear? Water. Water and nothing else. And you got all wet. Yeah, you got real wet at the same time. So this is um, like the sound of many waters. They didn't have Niagara Falls over there, so... Whatever waters he's talking about there. His right hand, number seven, what it have, have in it? Seven stars. Held seven stars. His mouth? Two edged sword. Out came a sharp two edged sword. Mm -hmm. Not dull, sharp. Used in Hebrews 4.12 that we mentioned a little earlier about the word of, of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. So you can cut both directions. 
Or if you want to go in, it's not slowing down on one side because it's cutting both ways as you stick somebody with. I've never done that, so don't misquote me. And how about his face, number nine? Like the sun shining in his strength, and I put on the, and again, I can't cover everything here, but on your, um, uh, the Jack Ebner translation, I put like the sun in its full power, and then parentheses like at new day, noon day. I could have put like that, but I couldn't fit it all on there. Any questions at this point with that part before we go to the last section? Moving too fast? This is why it helps a lot if you fill this in ahead of time then you're not playing catch up. You're just adding little things here and there or calling me on the carpet because you're going, this, that didn't make any sense. Now, I didn't go to the references. The references, I don't have time tonight to cover. They simply talk about some of these same things except for, I think, one of them. Um, even Daniel 7, you probably think this is God the Father, but Jesus Christ is God. So don't, never under, underestimate what he's going to look like as God. And they're describing him. But most of them are using these phrases in the book of Revelation, except for the third one, his head and his hair. Pat? So, to clarify, the person, the member of the last stand is not Jesus Christ. We're going to get to that. That's halfway down page two. So, as you look at the top of page two, how did John react now to this sight? He fell like a dead man. And what does as a dead man mean? Passed out on the ground, not moving, appears to be have no life. You, you go check for a heartbeat or you see if he's breathing. Lifeless appearance, motionless. That's all it's trying to say. Again, don't look for some supernatural meaning that you can fill volumes with. He's just trying to tell you he fell down like he was dead. You can find this other places in Scripture. When's the last time you did this? You ever seen something that made you fall down like a dead man? No. Okay, so this is, this is unique, at least in our lives, lifetime. Here's poor John. Not a physical picture because he couldn't see him physically. But a spirit, uh, he's in spirit. He's receiving this in a spiritual form of some way. What two things did Jesus do to comfort John? What was the touch? He laid his right hand, on him. Laid his right hand upon him. What was the purpose of that? Why would you do that? Calming, comforting. What's, why the right hand? What does the right hand represent? Why is he seated at the right hand of the Father on high? It's the hand of power. It's the strong hand. Few people are left-handed. What's the percentage of lefters, left-handers in the world? I think it's under 10%. But it's the majority, the right hand is where they're dominant. That's the one you want to keep an eye on if they have a sword in it. And that's why... Um, who was it? I heard something just recently. Just take a little deviation here because you guys are getting exhausted with my information. It was a, um, a guy that broke his hand. It was one of the big weight, heavyweight fights. If Bernie was here, he could tell me. So, Bernie, you tell me later because I won't remember the name. But it was a heavyweight fight. He broke his hand in, in a fight, and so and he kind of was out. He was never coming back. Well, this prize fighter was coming up, this other prize fighter, and he wanted somebody to spar with and just to defeat and, and stay in the limelight, working his way up to, the, you know, to beat the real guy. And he got in a fight with this guy. Well, in the meantime, his hand healed, and he could still hit with it. But what had he developed? His left hand. And guess how he knocked the guy out? The guy wasn't looking for the left hand. He was very weak on his left hand. His power was all in his right hand, and when he broke it, he no longer could use it. And the guy wasn't watching, and he came, hit him with the left hand and knocked him out. And he was the top. If you got to find out from Bernie now. See, he, Bernie will know who this guy is. It's a well-known fight. When I heard the name, I go, oh, I didn't know that's how it happened. But they, nobody expected this guy to win. And he took him out. Pat. Then he said that the world's population is Boy, you guys look up stuff. 10 to 12% of the world's population is left-handed. And why is it unknown, the 10 to 12? Because some of them are ambidextrous, ambidextrous and they never reveal it. Some of them are... Mixed up. They, they cut with scissors with their right hand, and they eat with their left hand. They write with their left hand. They do. So, and that's ambidextrous. So they, you know, what do you call them? What are they really? They're kind of two-handed. Aren't you two-handed? The word that's used Jim. with right hand with scissors simply because they don't work in the left hand. Ah. <laughs> they need to make left-handed scissors, which we have some. Would you like a pair? No. Because she doesn't need them. Because I can't work with them. 
Oh, because you never learned. But if you learn to work with them, then you can surprise somebody with how well you could cut with the left hand when they're expecting you to cut with the right hand. You, you get my point. Okay, Jim, and then we've got to wrap this up. We got a little piece of trivia. Okay, trivia. In the specialty that I was in called silviculture, if you had an all silviculture training session. Okay, Jim's in silviculture training session. Only half the room was left-handed. Half of the room was left-handed. And you start checking out some other things. As I pointed out to her, every time I see it in a movie, the pen comes up left-handed. I don't know why it stands out to me. Her whole family was left-handed, all five of them. But there are fields of people that go into that work, a lot of creative, artistic people. 50-50 in their family. So, yeah. So the other one's the left-handed judge that he went in to kill the king, and he wasn't expecting the sword to come from his left hand, and he put it in, and it buried in his fat. And he left them dead and locked them up. They thought he was using the bathroom, and, he, and they, he escaped before they figured it out. Nope, they left him in there dead. Okay, I'm getting way off here, so. Okay. Right. They, they mistreated left-handers in the old days, but I don't think they're doing that anymore, unless you get the wrong teacher. So his touch is with his right hand. His hand of power is being used to comfort. The hand that could hurt is, is being used to help. And then secondly, how about the talk? Do not be afraid. What he said was, with a command, do not be afraid. You could translate that, and I did it on my um, translation. Stop being afraid. What is John here? If you tell him to stop, he is afraid. If he fell down like a dead man, he is a very afraid, and we would probably respond the same way. Why was John not to be afraid according to verses 17 and 18? First one says, I am The first and last, the living one, should all go up in that first space. I know you didn't know that. But those go together because first and last means with the equal marks. He's God specifically in what realm? As a creator. He's before all things and he will always be. As things go away and or people are thrown into the lake of fire or Satan's banished or whatever, he is always there. So he's not only creator, he is also eternal. It's kind of what's being brought out by those phrases. He also says, secondly, that he wasn't beat afraid because I was dead. dead. I am alive, alive forevermore. forevermore. I shouldn't have parentheses after I am. I, don't, I think I put that up there the first time. I'm intending for that to be a quote. So make those little guys go away, but that didn't matter to you because you understood. I'm alive forevermore. So this represents what two things? Crucifixion. Resurrection. That's what he's bringing out here. You shouldn't be afraid because I have been before everything and I made everything and I'm eternal and my right hand is on you. You shouldn't be afraid, John. You shouldn't be afraid because even though I died, I'm alive. Even though I was crucified to die on the cross for your sins, I have resurrected. And the third reason you shouldn't be afraid is with double quotes there. Boy, I'm really, I raced through that one. I have what? The keys of death and Hades, which means I have what? Authority over man, body, and soul. Okay, authority over man, um, body, and soul, physically, spiritually. And he brings that out when he says here, I'm getting myself mixed up and away from the text. How does he say that there? Um, yep, I guess that's it. I was thinking of something else. So the idea here is he has authority, he has the keys, he's the one that has authority to open or to close both the physical and spiritual realms, and how do I know that? Because he says he has the keys of, of death, which is the physical realm, and of Hades, which is the spiritual realm. All people at that time were either, in, were either alive still on earth, or they were in Hades, that had been born. And so he says, I have authority over those two areas, totally. The seen and the unseen is what those would cover with death and Hades. And so the word keys, I had you look it up just to help, and I had a half a page to work with, so I threw it in there. 2807, what does he mean, the keys? His what? Power and authority is what one of the lexicons brought up. Okay, you did it on your own. All right. Anything else stand out about it? If you have the keys, you have the keys to the building, somebody's given you authority, and you have the 
power in the sense that you can make that lock open and open the door. So who must this person be in John's vision? This is where it comes down to. He must be God specifically because he represents too many characteristics. I mean generally and specifically the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one speaking to him. You're going to follow through in the whole letter. You're going to find if you have a red letter edition, it helps you to see those things. When he speaks for himself and doesn't just pass it on um, through John. Um, so I gave you some verses. I don't, I'm not going to take time to look them up. You did or you can follow up on your own. What command was repeated to John here in verse 19? Right. right. And right at once. It's a command. And what was he to record? What was in the past? Okay, how much had he seen and how long had he been seeing it? The vision recorded in verses 9 to 18. That's what he just saw. So, so John was to write that down. No, that was the gospel of John. All, and again, I keep forgetting to repeat stuff. Was it everything John had ever seen, or was it just related to the vision? I'm taking it as related to the vision. John had recorded everything that he, Christ's life and the purpose for his message in the Gospel of John. He, he challenged them to be in fellowship in 1 John. He wrote some little postcard letters to some specific people in 2 and 3 John and dealt with some issues there. But now he's writing the vision. So what people want to do here is they want to extend out, and this must be over his whole lifetime, what he's seen. I don't think so, but you can disagree with me. That's legal and that's allowed. But I think he's telling them, related to the context, the things that you have seen, I want you to write down what you just saw. And so when did John write it? Not while he's seeing it. After at least he saw that, and he may have given him an opportunity to see that. We don't know if this vision had a pause in it in some way. You know, for John to be able to, okay, get, pull out the, the scroll and find the ink and and have a sunny day because you got you can't do it at nighttime and or without torches or whatever. And so you're you're um, you're kind of having to figure out the details, but it's not important because God didn't share that with us. But it brings us back into reality. He did it somehow, somewhere. And in this case, what he's telling you is he wrote down what he saw. This present vision in chapter one is what I put in the the little equal signs, in case you're wondering what I'm expecting. And so the present, you say, well, wasn't that the present? No. That had already passed at this point. What's the present? The things which are, the the things which are, which are going to be the letters. the letters to the seven churches. That's what he's just told them about, and he's going to send these to them. And so I put down in my little space, because you're always asking me what I put in that line, I said the messages to the seven churches. Those things are going to occur in the next moment. I mean, they're just happening right then. And then, um, so it's the messages to the seven churches, and then, the future will be the things which you shall, or the things which shall take place. And what is that going to involve in the context? Future visions that you see brought out in the book of Revelation. So that's a little different idea. I was often taught that um, past, present, future, um, now, I, now I can't remember because I've been away from it so long. But they try to break down the whole book of Revelation that way. And that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit. We can talk more about that because I need to wrap this up. But at this point in time, um, it's, it's all that's forward after the seven churches. So chapter 1 ties in with chapters 2 and 3. What he shares about Jesus is shared with the seven churches. And it's Jesus telling them what they need to do. He's just passing on the message with the vision, partially represented in six of the seven letters. Dana? Uh, dispensationalism refers to the whole history of man. First dispensation was innocence, is what someone will call it. I don't know where the church ages come in. I've never believed that. I've never gone very far with that. If these are history, they just call that a historical view of the book of Revelation. So I don't know what a dispensationalist does with that. Um, the last one, I just put future vision, visions. Visions that were going to come up that you, you witness in the rest of the book. The rest of the book of Revelation you could put on there. Uh, after the seven churches. So what was a mystery to John in verse eight, uh, 20? Seven stars and seven golden lampstands. And a mystery simply means 
They were a secret. He didn't, because you defined that there. It was something that had a hidden meaning. That, that's all they were to John. It wasn't that they were mysterious or they, were, they had some symbolical thing that you could pull out all kinds of meanings from. That's not what he's saying. John just didn't understand when he's looking at this vision. There's seven stars and there's, there's seven lampstands, and he doesn't know what they represent. So he tells them right up front. What were the seven stars? The angels of the seven churches and the angels are messengers. I put that in brackets on mine. I put that in your um, translation that I wrote up for you. They're the seven stars are the messengers. I gave you another word there. They are also called envoys in some places. They're to carry a, a written document and, and pass it around. So what were the, or who were the seven lampstands? The seven churches. The seven churches, and those were local assemblies. And he left out Colossae, he left out Hierapolis, he left out Troas, and he left out some smaller cities. Why pick these seven? That's why people want to run with it, and they go, well, it must be because he's, he's trying to do a historical. He's trying to do this thing where they represent hundreds of years of history of the church. Okay? Paul wrote, seven Paul wrote two seven churches, as in his seven letters, except for Galatians is a bunch of churches because it's a province. It's like writing to Oregon is Galatians. But that's interesting to, to go back, and that's an interesting to notice and pick up on. That, that there are, um, they're writing. But I want you to treat this letter like you treat Paul's letters. Don't let people make it mysterious. Don't let them use the word apocalyptic like they're using in movies today to have some sinister um, blowing up of the world type of focus. That's not what it means. That's Satan. Once again, distorting. He use, changes the word adultery to living together. Or homosexual to being gay and they don't even I don't think they're even using that one anymore but he keeps changing meaning so that you don't connect scripture with life and he does it he did it with Eve in the garden has God said and so we're looking at this picking up God's word and we go what has God said and that's why I am nitpicky when it comes to scripture some people do not like me for that I, you don't have to like me but you better be careful with how you handle this or you're going to get way off track. If you, if you take it the wrong way, you'll end up out in the boonies wondering, what am I doing? And struggling greatly. So, Pat, last question because i got to close. Does Colossians mean the Lord really has to be the Lord? Oh, yes. I've been, I've been given out my uh, two things. My outline for, the, for my messages. You'll notice that's not in your packet tonight. I realize it was just confusing. People thought it was another one to fill in. It's gone. You're not going to get that anymore. If you want that from my old messages, I can give it to you. Some of you already have it and don't need it. So that's it gone. Do you need the mechanical diagram in the New American Standard? Anybody using that? Because I can get it to you. The translation that's right behind your question sheet. Where the, the text is. Okay, well, then I'm going to start leaving that out. I'm going to save paper. Make your notebooks be thinner. You can make up your own mechanical diagrams, or you can do whatever with that. And then if Brian puts these packets together, they, they will neither have numeric and standard out, because that puts it in a whole different category for me to start sharing it with the world. I'm, I, I'm not free to do that. I can do some of that with teaching purposes. And, um, and then I'll leave out that extra sheet at the back that isn't on it tonight, so you won't even miss it. I appreciate that. I'm kind of doing a mechanical diagram, but, it, yeah. but this translation will not work with your concordance. And again, to reiterate as we close, I use the New American Standard older translation, the first one. I don't, I don't know how to rate them. My concordance is the second one, so once in a while I can't find a word in my own concordance. And I track it down through the Greek and figure out what's the word. But now there's a new revision, and then there's the legacy that's come out that's made some other changes, but it's based on the New American Standard. So I'm not sure how they're going to clean this all up and not get people very, very confused. But us old people will die off, and then they won't remember the older translations. Okay? Let's pray. Oh, question? Is that uh, yes. Okay. So I will stop putting those in the packet. It'll be less things to have to print off. Uh, Father, uh, I know this is a, a long one tonight, uh, but it's exciting. If we can spend the time ahead of time to go through it and just take notes and to pick up uh, things that we didn't know or we uh, didn't see, um, 
then allow that to be the case and help each one in here not to be frustrated. Uh, help them um, to comprehend at the level they're at and, um, and to be excited about it. Help them to take a key point out of here and, and apply it to our lives. And for one of uh, them, for each of us tonight, we go before you right now and realize the vision that John saw is who you are. You took on a human body. And at this point, you had resurrected and you came back to share with John. You're still in that human body. And that's why you resembled a, a, a man, a son of man. And uh, that's who he saw. And that's who we're going to see when you come back. And we're going to see you in all the glory that's here and way beyond what John could even comprehend as he kept having to say it was like this and like that. So we stand, sit, are reminded here before you in total amazement and wonder at who you are and what it's going to be like to enjoy you throughout eternity and to make you be our focus. May we do that now in this life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.